God, when, when you thought of a pine tree, how did you think of a star? How did you dream of a damson west crossed with an inky bar? How did you think of a clear brown pool where flocks of shadows are? God, when you pattern a bird song flung on a silver string, how did you know the ecstasy that crystal call would bring? How did you think of a bubbling throat and a darling speckled wing? Why did you mate this moonlit night with the honeysuckle vines? How did you know the Madeira bloom distilled ecstatic wines? How did you weave the velvet dusk where tangled perfumes are? God, when you thought of a pine tree, how did you think of a star? That poem is from a 20th century poet named Angela Morgan. I don't know if she was a believer or not, but one thing that it illustrates is that there's a person who's looking at creation, pondering God, and trying to get at the heart and the mind of what God was thinking. It's poetry. And I don't really get poetry. <laughs> uh, but I do get that curiosity that's in that. And as has been mentioned a couple of times, we're in this, this series of looking at God through the Psalms. And Psalms is a collection of poetry. It utilizes all kinds of words and expressions and thoughts feelings and emotions that I just don't get. It uses metaphors and similes and anthropomorphisms where you attach human attributes to inanimate things. It uses different structures and patterns and rhythm. And like I said, I just typically don't get poetry, as my wife would attest with the lack of it that she gets from me. And as C.S. Lewis admitted in his introduction to his book on the Psalms, he's just learning it himself. And I'm just learning the Psalms, even though I try to spend every day a little bit in the Psalms. So hopefully today, together, we will discover a little bit what God has to say to us uh, in the 19th chapter of Psalms. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Uh, and as you do... Uh, let me just pray for us. Our Father God, we come before you today grateful that we can worship you. Uh, and we do want to be the type of people who would be worshiping you with all that we are, from the breath that we have right now to the last breath that we have on this earth. Um, but God, as we... Uh, look, we'll look at your word today. We'll see that you have revealed yourself to us uh, in multiple ways. Uh, we just need to open our eyes and see it and, and, and acknowledge you in it. And so, God, I pray that you'll speak to us today. And as the psalmist said, uh, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, though my wife would probably question it, I do think about her a thousand times a day. If I hear a country song on the radio, I think about her. And it's not just because that means she changed it from a classic rock station to a country station. I mean, I, I, I think about her when I hear those songs. When I see a flower or a, a garden worth of flowers in the field or in somebody's yard, I think of my wife, because I know that she would value the effort, the, the beauty of it. When I hear a Jane Austen reference or a phrase in Latin or the smell of something fabulous cooking, I think of my wife, because I know those things are things that she loves, and so I've learned to love them too. 
In fact, there really would be reminders of her everywhere I go if I were just to be wise enough to look and to pay attention. And I know, sadly, less from experience and more from her reminding me that she would really appreciate it that if I, when I thought of her, that I would respond in some kind of way. You know, give her a call or send her a text or something along those lines, right? You would like that. You know, like I said, that's a lesson I learned more from her telling me to rather than me actually doing it. But, but I share all that to ask you this question and for us to be thinking about this question as we look at Psalm 19. How and when do you think about God? What reminds you of him? What leads you to think about him? And when those thoughts come to mind, what do you do about it? How do you respond to him? Sometimes we only think about him if we are in need of something and we need his help. And so we turn to him and we should. When we are in need of something, we should be turning to God. When we are fearful of something, we should be turning to God. But, but God is so much more than just our little rescue. God is there. He's ever-present. And there should be more that draws our attention to him uh, than just our own need. And so we're going to look at... Uh, a little bit of that, how God has revealed himself here as David writes in Psalm 19. This psalm in particular is pretty special to me. Uh, I really like this one. When we had talked about which psalms to do, I asked if I could do this one. Um, I remember as a, probably a sophomore in college, I was, so maybe 19 years old, 20 years old, and I was sitting, well, I was driving in my car, coming home from, from Wayne State University, heading home, and I had Chuck Swindoll on the radio, which, you know, for me as a 19-year-old kid, listening to a, a, a pastor on the radio was, was actually something really new to, for me. I was just learning to grow in my faith. And he was preaching out of this passage. And so as a sort of this young believer, and hearing this on the radio, I was... I was it was interesting to me. I actually pulled over on I-94, heading west, kind of in the shadow of the big tire. If you guys know the Detroit area, know the big tire that's there. Um, I pulled over and I just started writing down notes, listening to Chuck Swindoll on the radio. And then when I got home, I went and pulled up my Bible. And I marked up my Bible with all these things that I've been hearing about this. And it was, I think, probably the first time in my life where there was something being said about God or something being said about Scripture that resonated with me that I felt like I needed to write this down. And so I love this psalm. One of the fun things about this one is if you just see right there at the header of it, it this isn't what would be considered the, 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 the scriptural part of it. This is just a header added. Um, but it's, says to the choir master or in some, in some translations to the director of music. Now, this is one of those poems that was meant to be sung. It doesn't consist merely of words but it consists of lyrics. In fact, C.S. Lewis as in the book that I mentioned earlier considered Psalm 19 and I quote to be the greatest poem of the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. That's a pretty high praise. Now, all right, you guys know me, so this is a joke, but he did write that about 10 years before Hey Jude was written, so he might have thought a little differently, but all right. So not to sound too sacrilegious about that, but of all the lyrics ever written, C.S. Lewis said these were the greatest lyrics in the world. So let's read this together. And since this poem is kind of broken up in three parts, 
I'm going to have us read it in three parts. And so how am I going to break this up? Hmm. Okay. I'm going to have the two ends. Can you stand with me? Actually, everybody stand with me, but I only want the ends to read this part. So we're just going to read the first six verses. And so, Noah, can you scroll through these slides with me? And let's, on the two end sections, let's read this aloud. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Right. Thank you. You may be seated. Now the other sections you'll get a chance to read in a few minutes here. So. So Psalm 19 is considered a wisdom psalm because it mainly instructs the reader or the singer the, on how they should live and how they can know God. These first six verses tell us that we can know God through his word. The heavens declare the glory of, uh, through his world, sorry. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Now often when we hear the word heaven, we think of a place where God resides. You know, we think of the throne room of God, you know, gold streets, similar to maybe the, the picture that Isaiah paints in Isaiah 6, where he says, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were angels each with six wings, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the sound of their voices shook the doorpost, and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Often, so when we think of heaven, we might think of a scene like that. And it's pretty easy to see where God's glory is there in that spot. But when David wrote this psalm, he was thinking not of the spiritual heaven where God is enthroned, but he's thinking of the heavens of the blue sky and of the night sky. He was saying that the skies continually testify about God. Now remember, David... He didn't have NASA and the Hubble Space Telescope to take pictures of super high resolution of deep space where you can see stars and all the galaxies that are thousands of light years away. David was saying that the visible skies, that which we could see with the naked eye, tell us something about God. That a clear blue sky tells us about God. The beautiful clouds and how they work to collect water and deliver rain tells us about God. The stars in the sky and the constellations, they tell us something about God. The moon and the phases of the moon declare the glory of God. So when David's looking at the sky and he's saying it says something about what exactly is the sky saying about God? You know, an atheist could actually look up at the sky and be awestruck by the stars and, and the way that our world works. And he can admit that he could admit that there's something glorious in what is being seen. But David, very poetically, says it's God's glory that we're seeing. 
It's the work of his hand, not some accident, not some randomness, some meaningless occurrence, but it's the glory of God and what he has done. And I really do think a, a very reasonable person can't help but think that it was all created by someone or at least something in maybe an unbeliever's mind of someone or something greater than ourselves. We can look at creation and see that it was someone who cares about beauty. That it was someone who cares about order. Someone who's purposeful. Someone who's powerful. Creation shows God's excellence. His magnificence. His intelligence. His creativity. His planning. His control. It says day after day. Night after night. The regularity, the, the consistency, the faithfulness of the days and the seasons reflect the consistency and the faithfulness of God. And so when David looked at creation, it got him to think about God and that all this pointed back to him. But how and to whom do the heavens testify about God? You know, there are 7,117 languages and dialects in the world today. According to Wycliffe Bible Translators, there are more than 1,800 known languages that still don't have a Bible translation even started. And even more that don't even have a Bible at all. And so how can people like that know or come to understand who God is? You could speak, like we heard last week, French or Portuguese or Ukrainian or Spanish or German or English. And you can read about God in your Bible. But what about those who don't have something in their language. See, creation here uses nonverbal language. It says in verse 4, their voice goes out to all the earth, but he uses no words. He uses no complex concepts or deep thoughts. But the skies are continually communicating visually. You know, we've all heard it said, what, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? When we look at the sky, what are the words that we're hearing? The skies have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet, according to to so verse 4, that their voice can be heard throughout the earth. No one is excluded. Anyone, anywhere, can look up, look up in the sky and see pretty much the same things that someone in another corner of the world is seeing. We share that language. And the message is really the same to everyone. That there is a glorious God out there who is worthy of worship. You know, as, as Pastor Van was, had mentioned earlier, the, this series on the Psalms is leading up to a series on Romans. And one of the ways that we pick some of the Psalms that we're going to do is because there are a number of Psalms referred to, or at least relate to, uh, the theology that is taught in the book of Romans. And this is one of those places 
where Psalms connect to the book of Romans. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1, and if you can help me and get me to the next slide there, Noah. It says, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. How has he made it obvious? So, well, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can see clearly his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. What about those who have never heard? I'm sure you've heard, asked that question or maybe at least heard that question. Well, Paul says they don't have an excuse. God has made it clear to them through the things that he has made. And the nonverbal voice of creation clearly points to God's eternal power and divine nature. If they truly wanted to know God, they would be able to see him. And he would reveal more of himself to them. Yet they suppress the truth. But that's a sermon for another time. Um, so you'll need to make sure that you're joining us here in the fall to hear uh, more of that from Romans. But going back to the Psalms passage, there on the next slide it says, in true poetic form, in, his, in the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other, and nothing is deprived, deprived of its warmth. David says, just as an example of all of this, look at the sun. God has pitched a tent for it where it stays all night. But when the morning comes, look out. It comes bursting forth like a groom on his wedding day, saying, get me to the church on time. Or he's like a champion runner running his victory lap, saying, everybody, look at me. I just won. The sun rises and sets Every day as it should, and nothing can escape its heat. And so the skies continually testify about God. Yeah. Oh, look at this picture. Uh, this is, I don't know, up here in the, the far right corner, up here, that's the Andromeda Galaxy. I don't know if you heard about this, but a few years ago, the Hubble Space Telescope took a picture of this with like, I don't know, like a billion gigapixels or some really crazy. Uh, you can zoom in on that and see the billions upon billions of stars just in a corner of that little spiral galaxy. The heavens declare the glory of God. But nature's voice is limited. It does tell us that God exists. And as we've already discovered, it reveals some things about his character and his attributes. But we need God's words to actually get to know him. God reveals who he is through his written word. Creation and nature doesn't tell us about sin and God's plan for salvation. It doesn't tell us why we're here and what our purpose for life is. Nature points to God and tells us that we can know him, but it doesn't tell us who he is. 
So we can get to know God, who he is, through his word. And these next three verses tell us how we can know God through his written, written word. So I'm going to have you guys stand again. And this time I want this section right here to do the reading of these next three verses. So we're going to start at verse 7, and I'm just going a little quickly. All right, so read with me here, this section here. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And the decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. All right, you may be seated. Thank you. So while the skies continually testify about God... It's the scriptures that clearly reveal who God is. So David shifts here from praising God, who reveals himself in nature, to praising the same God for revealing himself in his word. It's as if he's saying the skies tell us much about God, but the scriptures tell us much more about him. And David uses six six synonyms, not synonym, synonyms, to describe God's word. He calls it the law, statutes, precepts, commands, the fear of God, and and the decrees or ordinances. And some of your translations might have slightly different terminology of that, but he uses these different ways of describing the one, the one book of God's word. And then he goes on to add six adjectives, or eight adjectives, to describe the character of God's word. That it's perfect. It gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That it's trustworthy, it's reliable and certain. That it's right, it's morally, practically, and universally correct. It's radiant or pure. That it's holy and lovely and, and set apart. He says it's clean or pure. And that it will never fade or corrode or, or diminish in any way. And the last adjective he uses is that it's firm or true. That there's nothing false in God's word. This is how we get to know God. And then he goes to add four effects that God's word can have on our life. That it revives or refreshes or converts the soul. I don't know about you, but I need that quite often. My soul hurts and grieves at times. And I need God's word to revive it, to refresh it. The second effect is that it makes simple people wise. That it gives joy to the heart. What do we find joy in? We can find it in God's word. And that it gives light to our eyes. That it gives us insight for living. And the word of God can have this kind of effect on our life because as Hebrews 4.12 says, that God's word is living and it's active. It, it, it isn't just a collection of of words or poetry or, or, or philosophy, but it is something that gets in between our, our way of thinking and it cuts to the core and, and reveals who we are and what we need and, 
and that where the answer is found in God alone. In many ways, first and foremost, God's word tells us about who God is. We can't separate God's word from God himself. We do. We hold a very high view of scripture. Sola scriptura. Scripture alone. Which means that the Bible is the sole infallible source of authority for the Christian faith and practice. But that doesn't mean that we worship this book or that the Bible is God. Then what it's getting at is that because God is perfect, his law is perfect. Because God is trustworthy, his statutes are trustworthy. Because he is right, his precepts and his commands are right. And you follow where we're going with that? That because God is who he is, that's what makes scripture as reliable and as good as it is. Because of who God is. It's through the Bible that we learn about the God who created the heavens and the earth. Who created the stars in the sky. It's through the Bible that we learn about the nature and the character of the God who made all of the things that we see. And it's through the Bible that we come to, to faith in Christ. Again, going back to Romans, or looking ahead to Romans, in Romans ten seventeen, it says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of God. We need to see the picture of creation. That draws us to God. But we need the word of God so that we get to know him and come into, helps us, leads us into a relationship with him. Charles Spurgeon in his commentary on the Psalms, which is called the Treasury of David, said, he is the wisest who reads both the world book and the word book as two volumes of the same work and feels concerning them. Because he says, my father wrote them both. Both the world book and the word book. All right, let's stand one last time. And we're going to read... The next few verses of this section. And if this is your first time here, we don't, we don't normally make people go up and down multiple times in a sermon. I just, I just wanted to make sure you stayed awake tonight. But. All right, so read with me uh, verses 10 through 14. And we're going to do this section here since you guys have yet to read. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. May, but who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. Now everybody, let's read this last verse together. May the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock, my redeemer. All right, maybe see them. Thank you again. Now this last part tells us that we can know God when we live according to his will. So there, if you fill in the blanks in your notes, that his servant conscientiously respond to God's will. We respond to God's will in three ways. First, we recognize the value of God's word. We submit to God's word in confession. And then we worship the Lord. So as servants conscientiously respond to God's word, and again, the first one is that we recognize the value 
of his word. He very poetically says that it's more precious than gold. It's sweeter than honey. Now think about what the psalmist, what David is saying here. The law of God is precious and valuable and sweet. Remember the words that he used? He used laws and precepts, commands, decrees. David wasn't saying that it's God's love that is valuable or that it's his grace that is sweet or that it's his mercy that he wants to have, which I'm sure all those are true. God's love and grace and mercy and his encouragement, they are all valuable and they're all sweet. But God's laws to him in this poetic way, is more precious than gold. If you could eat them, you would find them sweeter than honey. As David wrote in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. It would be a good thing to remember or point out that David was writing this saying the immense worth and value, value of God's word he only had a fraction of what we have today. His Bible would have consisted only of the first five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, Joshua and Judges, maybe a few Psalms already, perhaps Job and Ruth, but not much else. That means he's looking at Leviticus and Deuteronomy and saying, this is more valuable than gold. Now, how many of us pick up our Bible and say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to spend some time in Leviticus and Deuteronomy today because that's really sweet portions of Scripture. Now, we find those passages really hard because they're the laws and we don't get them because a lot of them are culturally. It, it's, this is David saying that the law of God is precious and valuable. Can you imagine what he would have written if he had it all? If he had Isaiah that described the throne room of God that we read about earlier? Or if he had the prophecies that talked about the suffering servant. Or if he had the Proverbs that were written just a few years later by his son. Or if he had the New Testament where he could read about Jesus. What would David have said about Scripture then? What do we say about Scripture now? We have all that. Without a doubt, God's Word is far more valuable and sweeter to taste than David ever knew. And the second way that we respond to it is we submit to God's Word in confession. The Word warns us about living in harmful ways. But it says that if we obey and live God, life God's way, that there are benefits and rewards. But David recognizes that just as the prophet Jeremiah did, that a person can't truly understand the depths of their own sin and depravity. And so he says, forgive me of my sin. And he says, forgive me of my hidden sins the ones that I don't even know or realize that I'm doing. You know, the ones that, you know, as we hear, you know, that he's nose blind to. That he just does them, but maybe he doesn't know that they're wrong, or he does them out of habit and doesn't even consciously sink in that it's wrong. So he says, forgive me of my hidden sins. 
And I do like that he says, forgive me of my willful sins, my presumptuous sins. I am far too much like David in this. These are the ones where he says, you know what? Forgive me my sins. Keep me from those sins that I know that I'm doing. I just don't care that I'm doing it. Maybe I'm the only one who deals with that, but I don't know. I remember in my accountability group that I had back in college, and we would come back and we would talk, about like, you know, how, how are you guys doing in this area of, of lust? How are, are you committing it to God? Are you? And there were times that we'd say, you know what, I'm not struggling with it. I'm, I'm just doing it. There are times when we as husbands say, you know what, I know I should be loving and gracious toward my wife. I'm just not going to because she's annoying me today. And, you know, women, you do that too at times, right? You know, I'm not going to presume to say what those are, but, but you know, we all do that. So we submit to God's word and confession. And then the last thing as we wrap up this portion of our service is that we submit to God through in worship. It says our words, our thoughts, he wants to be pleasing to him. And when we acknowledge that he is our God, that he is our rock, he is our redeemer, we are putting on him who he is, as it should be. That we worship our God, not just through our holy living, but by attributing to him the worth that he is due. And so this beautiful lyric of a song, and I don't know how many of you as we were going through this might have been singing that old Maranatha I think it was a Maranatha song from the 70s uh, that comes directly out of this. But as we read this, as we hear those words put on our mind, we need to remember that, that God is made known through his world that he made. That he is known personally through his word. And then he is also known personally and to others through his worshipers, through those who worship him. And I think this is just a fitting way for us to go into our communion time today. As we worship the Lord, as we come before him in, in confession and acknowledge who he is, we're going to share in communion. And as we transition to that, I just want to say, if you're new here, if you're a guest with us, I just want you to know we celebrate communion, what we call an open communion. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a Baptist to take communion with us. Um, but if you have committed your life to Christ, we invite you to participate with us. This is a, a celebration for us as believers to remember what God, what Jesus has done for us on the cross. It's a way that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so what we do, we have ta three tables set up in the back. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to go back and you can pick up uh, the element that we'll take in communion and we'll take it together. But as we think about who God is and what he's done, what he's created for us and how we have come to know him, we want to remember not just who God is in creation, but what he has done for us on the cross.
So I'm going to pray, and then you can go back and just, uh, in a, a quiet way, and go back to the tables, pick up the elements, and return to your seats, and then we'll, we'll take it together in a moment. So our gracious Heavenly Father, God, we come before you today thankful that you have revealed yourself to us. That when we look outside, that we can see uh, that there is a God out there who has designed all this, who knows us, and who loves us. More than that, God, you've given us your word, and what a privilege it is that we have to be able to read your word. And that we can know you through this book. And one of the specific ways, one of the the most precious ways that we know you is through personally through your son, Jesus. And so, Father, as we celebrate communion now, God, um, thank you for what you have done for us on the cross. Thank you for saving us and making us your own. And that that you, the eternal God, has allowed us to be in a personal relationship with you. So we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.